Hello, everybody. Welcome to this talk as part of the Edible England and Opal Cambridge week of talks and events. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the history of food in Cambridge, an interest I've had for some years connected with my studies of local history in Cambridge, which I have pursued for quite a while now. My particular interest was in Sturbridge Fair, about which I wrote a little book a few years ago, but I've extended that to cover interests in who was eating what how was different provision made for both the rich and the poor, uh, as I hope you'll see from this short presentation. So we'll go with it. Food, uh, an issue that's come to the fore in recent times as we suddenly become aware that we can't rely on it arriving. We can't be sure who we're allowed to eat with or when or where. Um, and we find ourselves in situations like this with increasing numbers of places to eat outdoors for fear of spreading infections indoors. Food has always obviously been critical to everybody. And we do seem reminders in Cambridge of the importance of production of food in times past. Here we have the remains of mills now used for other purposes, but once vitally important for milling the corn that made the bread that was the staple food for centuries even down to the millstone that you can still see in the pavement outside the old Kings and Bishops mills. And the maltings, uh, Newnham maltings, still there as a little building used for other purposes, as is Dale's Brewery down in Gwider Street. But beer was the principal drink for most people, although people did drink water, contrary to popular belief. Even on the Guildhall doors, look carefully if you happen to be there sometime and look at these beautiful bronze reliefs showing the plowing, the sowing, uh, and other agricultural activities worked onto the doors of the Guild Hall. And obviously, not surprisingly, the Corn Exchange has scenes of uh, plowing and harvesting. And that goes on through the representations of the town, as we'll see. Slightly more surprisingly, perhaps, outside the Guild Hall doors, if you look again at the bronzes beside the doors, fish absolutely critically important too to Cambridge in earlier times. And we have these lovely representations. Here's West Cambridge, the view across from the fields. And so many Cambridge people would have been involved in the plowing, the sowing, the weeding and harvesting uh, in previous centuries, as we can see here. You get a fine view of King's Chapel in the background. Um, but the fields were large. These fields belonged to Cambridge. You can see about 30, thousand acres, sorry, 3,000 acres, uh, 1,300 hectares of fields outside the actual built up area of the town. So that was a vast area that was producing wheat, rye, barley, peas and beans for, for the consumption of Cambridge people. Also around the town, the pastures, which we still have in use. It's rather nice, isn't it, that we still have the cows out on the commons. And earlier pictures show us uh, this same situation uh, from um, around 1600, this happy couple with a horse and cow behind them. Uh, and little drawings like this, the back of Queen's College, lots of animals frisking about, um, mostly cattle, but sheep as well. And being driven through town, a commonplace site in earlier centuries as the animals were being brought to market uh, and to the uh, beast market and the slaughterhouses. We've even got chickens in this picture, a reminder that people could have their own poultry as well as a pig in their backyards. Our first map of Cambridge sums all this up. Cambridge in 1574. And here we see the town itself with lots of red roofs, um, but also between the houses, you've got gardens still. So, and in those gardens, people are growing their vegetables, their herbs, and they have orchards of fruit trees. Around the edge, again, the, the many animals you can see pictured, um, mostly cattle and sheep, but pigs down on St. Thomas Lees as well. And just on the right-hand side, a little bit of the corn growing uh, just behind Christ College. When we get a close-up of this map, we can see the critical part of Cambridge's economic life in earlier times, the market. If you look at the bigger picture there, you see Market Hill with Market Ward written on, the whole of that open area behind Great St Mary's Church, um, right down to what is now the Corn Exchange, was in very early days, the market area. And then as you can see, buildings encroached upon it. 
uh, so the market stalls uh, have to be fitted in around the, the permanent buildings. Uh, the market is really, really important, of course. It was there from such early times, it never had a charter, it didn't need one, it had always been there. Uh, but markets have to be controlled. Um, it's critically important to people that they know where and when they can get this food, who, who's going to produce it, how it's going to be monitored. Uh, and these sorts of considerations were checked from very early times. Uh, in the first place, of course, it's the town government that looks after markets. But here Cambridge is different from the time when the students arrive from the uh, early 1200s, they're concerned about the prices of food for their students. And it doesn't take too long before the university can take control of weights and measures and prices in the market. They take that authority away from the townspeople um, for the protection of the students. This is much resented, of course, but it goes on until the 19th century. But the corporation still does retain some important features. Markets begin usually with a bell. There is a set market time. Uh, in Cambridge, market day was traditionally always Saturday. Um, other days could be used sometimes, but Saturday was the main market day. Uh, and from the time in the morning when it started to the end of the day, that was when you would be able to buy your main fresh produce from within and from outside town uh, as the country people came in to sell their goods. Different areas of the um, market were allocated for different things. Almost in the middle, you can see some little booths that were for the butchers. Butchers trade was really important. Meat has always been considered, until very recently, the prime food, the food that was consumed mostly by richer people um, and not quite so available to the poor. Just off the map at the bottom right-hand side, you can see Slaughterhouse Lane. So that's where the beasts were killed and then brought in as corpses, as bodies uh, into the butchers' yards. Almost as equally important were the fishmongers. Um, and they had a, a set area in the market as well. Um, it moved eventually to Pease Market Hill, which you can also see marked. Um, peas and beans originally sold there, of course, but it later became known as the fish market. Uh, as an aside, at the same time, of course, Petty Curie also indicates food provision. Uh, the name means the little street of the cook shops. So from early times, that's where you could buy your instant food, your pies uh, and other things that needed baking in an oven. This area of uh, the middle of Cambridge, you can also see includes the Guild Hall next to where it says Market Ward. Um, and various of the other big houses in the centre that belong to the mayor and the aldermen. And these are the sort of people who would be able to have occasional feasts, um, occasional junkets, as they call it, uh, of which they would have numerous meat dishes, um, as well as finer th sweet things to follow. Uh, the university, just off the big picture, but in the smaller one, would also have times when it feasted uh, and celebrated with large dinners. Of another view much later, the market, not on a market day. So this is how the space looks. There's only one building still remaining here. If you look right on the left-hand side of the picture, there's that beautiful little porch that's been moved up to the first floor, still to be seen. All the other buildings have been replaced or have gone completely. But we can see on the ground a few people sitting down selling fruit or vegetables from their baskets. And in the background, the Shire House that was built in the 18th century for the butchers to sell underneath in the arcades. And back to Lyne's map of 1574. So here again, we can see the animals cavorting in the fields, but the river, the river has always been, of course, of prime importance to Cambridge. Uh, on the right, you can see some little boats bringing up goods from Kings Lynn, uh, from other parts of the Fens, they would have been bringing uh, building materials, but also foodstuffs, fish, wild fowl, and particularly from the summer pastures, butter from the cows. Butter came in huge quantities into Cambridge, not all to be eaten here, but some of it to be sent on to other places. 
on the larger picture of the river, if you look very, very carefully, you can see a little way below the bridge, that is to say upstream, there's a tiny little rowing boat with uh, a fishing line or a weighted net in the stream across for the catching of fish. And fish were hugely important um, in earlier times. So some early pictures, I particularly like the one at the bottom. This is sea fishing out in colder waters where the two little figures are sitting on an ice floe uh, and the fish do seem a little large even for those days. Uh, otherwise fishing in nets in rivers was very common as I've suggested. And through the middle ages, the church insisted on fast days, uh, 40 days of Lent, Fridays, um, eves of festivals in the church. So uh, there were many occasions when meat was banned and fish could be substituted. So it did lead to a lot of fish eating. Even in the 16th century, the government extended fish days to Wednesdays and Saturdays, not for religious reasons, but so that they could encourage the sea fishing industry to provide them with seamen and ships whenever they were needed to supplement the Navy. We've got more illustrations, uh, the little one at the top there showing the same sort of eel traps as have been used until quite recent times. So eels always been important in the Fenland area in early times used by the barrel load for rent payments. Uh, and in later times, just for general eating. Now the pike at the bottom are very significant fish. I've tried to put it to scale there. They could grow to a meter or more long, huge fish uh, and the scavengers that eat everything else in the river, but immensely prestigious. So it, these were used as gifts for visiting nobles, royalty and dignitaries who came to Cambridge. The corporation would regularly pay out to the pike mongers, the specialist fishmongers, to provide one or two pike for these visiting nobles, uh, along with perhaps some other fish, maybe with rabbits and other foodstuffs, uh, to uh, be taken presumably to their inns where the noblemen and their entourage would be able to deal with a fish the size of a pike. There were other foodstuffs given to visitors in the end. Uh, they did also go in for large quantities of marzipan uh, and of course a gallon of wine uh, accompanied most of these presents. It's quite difficult to uh, see sometimes exactly how you would have presented these, but I imagine that sometimes they went straight to the inn where the person was lodging. And the corporation itself used to go on fishing trips. The mayor and aldermen would set off from the, the mill pond. You can see that's Queen's College in the background uh, and do a sort of boundary fishing trip all the way around to Fen Ditton where they could consume whatever fish they'd, they'd managed to catch on the way. But the other big source of food, uh, an important trading point for Cambridge was Sturbridge Fair. So this gives you a rough idea of where the fair was in relation to the town centre. Out on the fringes beside the New Market Road between the road and the river, uh, originally founded as um, a benefit to the leper hospital that stood beside the little Coldham's Brook. Uh, immensely important, not only to Cambridge, but to the whole region for the commodities that were brought and traded wholesale as well as retail. And here we've got a little map that gives us an idea of some of the things that were being sold. Fish, really, really important, as I've said, it could be brought fresh, but it could also be brought uh, salted or dried so that it was well preserved and you could carry on eating it through the year. Uh, not always very tasty, I understand, but yeah, it's food. Oysters were incredibly important at the fair because in those days they were cheap, uh, everybody ate them, uh, and they were a delicacy enjoyed right through the fair uh, during the two or three weeks that the fair lasted. We've also got here the hop fair. Hops introduced in about the 16th century uh, to turn ale into bitter beer, uh, and the quantities, vast sacks of them, were brought not only to feed or to provide Cambridge with drink, but for other areas. Also on this map, we've got the mayor's house and the proctor's house. 
both the town and the university had to proclaim the fair. Uh, and having done that, they would retire to their respective buildings to have a lovely feast of roast goose, pies, fish, uh, and other delicacies um, to be enjoyed before they went round the fair to buy this and that as they needed to. The top end of the fair, the south end beside Newmarket Road, the grocers are really important again because they were um, selling the luxury spices and similar commodities, as we'll see in a minute. Cook's Row, where some of the specialist cook shops were that were producing the roast goose and other foodstuffs. And then the cheese row, the cheese row of little booths, again, immensely important as we'll see in a moment. The big booths looked like this. So the grocers would have been able to set up in a, a large shop-like booth with counters and shelves behind uh, and all their various delicacies as we'll see in a minute. The cheese was so important that the Cambridge newspaper used to give the prices. These are per hundredweight. So a hundredweight is about 50 um, kilos. Uh, and you'll see, yeah, substantial prices. They also commented on the supply of hops that were coming. The little image at the bottom, you can just about see that by the cheese row, a little round hard cheeses have been drawn in. And this is also gives us an indication of the changes in prices during the 18th century, which, as we'll see in a minute, becomes really critically important. Um, the prices rising quite almost consistently uh, up to the end of the 18th century. And this little news item at the bottom indicates that this poor chap who had bought eight cheeses, one has to imagine these are the big round cheeses, had been brought to supply his entire family and he's lost them. So that's a serious dent to his household economy. The university was involved, as I've said before, in checking the quality of goods. And this is the one implement they've still got, which shows us that they could check barrels, barrels of butter or tallow. Uh, you put this little brown tube down into the barrel and take out a core, which shows you whether the butter or tallow at the bottom is the same quality as at the top. And the university regularly fined anybody bringing that sort of commodity or other commodities to the fair, which were substandard. So they checked the fish. They didn't want rusty fish. Um, they didn't want tallow with um, other rubbish at the bottom uh, and other similar things. Feathers were also examined. Uh, and meat, likewise. At the fair, uh, you could also, of course, um, sit down to have some um, entertainment uh, and enjoy coffee. Coffee booths found, or coffee houses found in Cambridge from the end of the 18th century. The university, oh, sorry, 17th century. The university very doubtful about this at first as being a place where undergraduates could waste their time sitting, drinking coffee and reading the newspapers. And Jacob Britton uh, had his own crockery, and some of it you can see in little pieces uh, in the Museum of Archaeology. But the spices the grocers were selling, this is an indication of just how expensive they were. If you look at the cloves and cinnamon, that's nearly a shilling for an ounce. Now, the little modern jars are about an ounce. But they sell at 85 pence. Compare that with our incomes to the income of the laborer back in the 18th century, who could not possibly afford to spend that sort of sum out of his weekly wage. And the advertisements also aimed at the richer folk. Teas, coffee and chocolate drink came in during the 18th century to be sold as we've seen at the coffee house and other places. Nutmegs at 80 shillings a pound. Who's got, uh, sorry, 30 shillings. Who's got 30 shillings? Um, all sorts of other commodities being sold by J. Twiss. And then just a reminder at the bottom um, that the butter which was coming from the Fens, really, really important, a whole butter wagon. And with the unfortunate result here that the chap was sleeping on top was killed when the thing overturned. The grocers therefore were fairly important people in Cambridge. So here's Elizabeth Mortlock. Um, who warrants a really fine portrait with her little son um, somewhere in the later part of the century. 
Finally, the directory, the Universal British Directory, sums up in 1791 a list of all the main commodity sellers in Cambridge, from which we learn there are 24 bakers, there are 24 grocers, there are 11 butchers, plus some doing pork meat. Um, there's the gingerbread bakers, two of them, as well as quite a lot of innkeepers and publicans. You'll note also there's farmers, 13 farmers, still cultivating those big fields outside the, the town center. So what about the university? We touched on that at the beginning, that the university was very concerned about the prices in the market for its students and their food. Uh, and the concerns continue. An interesting little fundraising plea in London in the middle of the 16th century, when Thomas Lever describes the life of the students, he said that most of their time is spent earnestly in prayer, in study, in reading, uh, and they have these two scanty meals, a penny piece of beef amongst four with a little bit of porridge of broth, a uh, supper not much better, uh, describing them as the living saints. But there was also another problem about food supplies, and that was that the royal court would send out its messengers and its buyers to procure foodstuffs for the court from across the country. The university complained bitterly that these people were coming into the Cambridge and the Cambridge area and buying up stuff and therefore raising the prices or decreasing the amount of food available. So they had to introduce an act of parliament to say that these folk couldn't come within five miles of Cambridge. And the dearth in the 1550s uh, was indeed a very notable um, uh, event. Colleges um, came to have big kitchens, of course. This is a wonderful print of Trinity College's kitchen where you can see uh, some poultry on the table, the big fire before which you can roast joints. Uh, it does seem to have some vegetables. Vegetables rarely get mentioned in lists of food. We get lists of the joints of meat, uh, the poultry that's being uh, eaten, but rarely the vegetables. And I think that's because they are so commonplace and relatively cheap that nobody sees fit to mention them. It's said by some that at college halls, the meat provided for the students' dinner in these later days, when we got a little bit beyond Thomas Lever's scanty uh, provision in 1550, um, that the joints were slung down the table and each student had to just chop off a few slices as it passed him um, and a bit of a pudding and not much else provided. So we've got some little 19th century sketches. It looks rather more civilized, doesn't it, in that top picture? But we can see again that the servants are bringing in joints on the table. Uh, there is provision also for every student to have a, a helping of bread and beer from the buttery. And if they want their evening suppers to be supplemented, they went out to uh, other eating places or they commissioned from the college cook uh, extra dishes to be brought to their rooms or sometimes from the inns in town. And people would see the waiters running from the inns to the colleges with the dishes on a tray on their heads. The side beneficiaries of some of this were the college bed makers. Every student had a bed maker come to do just that, but also to do a bit of cleaning, um, putting the kettle on for tea. Students were apparently incapable of doing that for themselves uh, and the washing up. But where there was some little bits of food left over, it was quite acknowledged that the bed makers would take that away. They were badly paid and they needed these little supplements of whatever they could glean from their students to take home to their parents, uh, their families. So the poor generally, the poor always there, how were they provided for? They certainly weren't getting joints of meat most of the time. Uh, in the 16th century, people who described how they wanted their funerals to be arranged would often say there should be a handout of bread to the poor, partly to get the poor there to the funeral to add their prayers um, to the deceased, uh, but also they felt that this would be a, a way of showing their own charity um, and the poor would come to the funeral just for bread quite significant that was enough to bring people the parishes were obliged in the end to help their own poor reluctantly so that in the end we had to have the poor law 
which enabled or empowered parishes to raise rates to help their poor and to set up workhouses. The colleges in the end were also contributing to these. Uh, they made regular contribution of, uh, to the town funds. And there was a, a separate private arrangement of soup that was distributed from the kitchen at St. John's. As we mentioned before, 1550s were a bad time. There was dearth because of harvest failure and harvest failures were critical, forced up the price of bread to an extent that the poor were in serious trouble. So the town and gown had to combine to assess the better off uh, to raise sums of money to help the poor. It worked in 56, didn't quite work in 96 where they were having a debate about who should be raising what and how it should be distributed. Nearly two centuries on, the poor are more numerous and they're prepared to take action. Uh, in this particular dearth in 1750s, we see here the report in the newspaper, a great number of people assembled and they broke open a corn chamber and carried away the corn they found in it. That wasn't enough. Uh, the next day, there were more people on the streets and despite the fact that the constables were called out, um, they attacked another store of corn which was being defended. The defenders unfortunately fired on the crowd, causing some serious injuries. Uh, the whole situation got quite out of control, but nevertheless, the firers deserted their post in the end and the poor were able to carry off the corn from that particular store. The end of the century, um, things recurred. 15, uh, 1790s, here where again, we have a serious problem over rising food prices, both of bread and of meat. Um, and the mob assembles on a Friday afternoon to seize a lighter, a boat on the river that's laden with flour. Fortunately, um, the magistrates this time are, are in greater control uh, and they manage to get hold of all the, the, the corn, the flour um, and carry it off to the town hall uh, and arrange that from there, it's going to be distributed to the poor uh, at a reasonable price. Um, the, Mr. Mortlock is the deputy mayor uh, and he actually compensates the person they've taken the, the flower from. Uh, and they fix a price uh, and also declare that meat is going to be sold at this fixed price. This is John Mortlock. Um, used to wonder how he did it, but I think we can see from his portrait that charm must have come into it somewhere and charisma because he undertook uh, to try to keep the situation under control. And this sort of notice was posted in the newspaper. I don't know how many of the poor inhabitants could actually read, but presumably they'd find somebody read it for them. So here we have this note that they are not going to allow this forestalling, engrossing and regrating uh, these means of buying up stocks and reselling at higher prices. So Mr. Mortlock, we hear, continues on horseback to try and keep the peace um, and doesn't call in constables and uh, uh, others to help him in this because, as he could tell from the previous occasion, uh, if you overdo it with constables and so on, somebody is going to get hurt. So he manages to keep order and peace and keep everybody quiet. And there's a subscription to raise money to uh, help give the poor bread at the reduced price. Um, His Majesty's cruisers are managing to get hold of vessels in the North Sea that have got stores of uh, provisions. And at the bottom, this is the ultimate savior, the fact that wheat is going to come in from America uh, and from Canada, of course. And that is going to be the solution to the growing need uh, in Britain. There's one celebrated occasion when the poor did get treated. This is the occasion of the coronation dinner or Parker's piece when Queen Victoria was crowned in 1838. It, you can see it's an incredible spread. There are about 3000 people there who are being fed at tables, um, mostly the poor adults, but also Sunday school children. The people who couldn't make it um, because of age or illness were also given some food in their own homes. But these people are being treated to huge quantities of uh, joints, meat joints, about 7,000 of those, pounds and pounds of plum pudding, uh, extra pickles and mustard to go with it, 
and um, cartloads of bread, um, all distributed by a system. Well, one can hardly see how they did it, but the people have been brought parish by parish, uh, and it seems that they had organized lots and lots of stewards and other helpers to enable this distribution to take place. Quite extraordinary occasion. But we're reminded that the poor were often at other times in desperate need. This is the point where the workhouse, the union workhouse is opened down in Mill Road. Another picture of the market, um, as we can see it flourishing on a market day uh, in about 1820. And this very much reproduced picture showing the stalls in color where you can see the poultry uh, and the vegetables uh, in the various stalls. A particular curiosity of Cambridge was that it was possible to buy butter by the yard. This was a butter, a pound of it rolled out to a yard length. Really, it was supposed for the benefit of the colleges who could then chop it up into convenient individual portions. And here we have the one photograph of this gentleman with his pound of butter rolled out to a yard. But notice uh, an advertisement in the Visitor's Guide to Cambridge offers you the chance of buying yards of bread so that you can put bread around your yard of butter. Um, they're in Clarendon Street. They're notable for all sorts of bread and particularly wholemeal brown bread recommended by doctors and vegetarians. This is 1880. They seem to be well ahead of the fashion at the time. And from the 19th century, we do then get, of course, photographs of the food supplies in town. Sebley's here. I do wonder whether you'd want to these days to go into the tea, coffee and dining rooms uh, through a door that's surrounded by hanging up hams. That's an extraordinary quantity, isn't it? One wonders how quickly they were sold or how dusty they'd got by the time they'd been hanging next to the working street. But it was commonplace. Here we have another shop with the rabbits hung up, uh, as well as vegetables set in the uh, lower displays. Um, many advertisements uh, for the providers of food. Butchers continuing very, very important. Um, you can see here, families, colleges, and schools supplied special attention to early morning country orders. Uh, so they're looking at the market beyond Cambridge itself and they can boast the patronage of the Prince of Wales. Milk, always a bit of a problem milk until recent times because it so often goes off and you can't rely on keeping it in those days. Hence the liberal production of butter and cheese as being the only way to deal with fresh milk. So here we have the horse drawn cart with the uh, loads of milk in the back and our nice lady uh, accompanying it. But round in Rose Crescent, uh, Mr. Arnold Milkman will supply you milk and cream from Chesterton. So it's not far away. You can be sure that this is coming fresh into the town centre and you can buy your glass of milk over the counter as well. Several notable firms of grocers spring up in the middle of Cambridge. We saw in previous pictures, there was Harrison and others in the 18th century. Here in the 20th, Matthews in Trinity Street becomes a particularly famous store with all sorts of provisions uh, and deliveries. Um, the contrast between their deliveries in 1910 uh, and much later between the horse and the motor vehicle. The early shop, of course, had to have stables at the back in order to uh, keep all the horses ready for these trips around town. And quality is what they're offering. Being able to keep food longer and store food longer makes a huge difference, of course, to our food supplies. Um, this wonderful display, again in Matthew's shop, shows that once you can put things into tins, you're entering a whole different era of food supplies. Uh, it will, tins will keep indefinitely. Despite what it says on them, often you can keep them a lot longer than their sell-by dates. Uh, and this display is making the most of that sort of uh, offer. But still the market's important. Um, notable that despite pressures to the contrary, we're still getting fresh fruit and vegetables on the market. It's now thoroughly under the control of the city council. The control of the university ended in the 19th century, 
So it's up to the city exactly who gets a stall on the market and what they can sell. And notable also, of course, that if you buy from the market, you do not get plastic wrappings. Paper bags, but not plastic. And in recent times, we've seen huge numbers of individual private shops, which is uh, encouraging, uh, often selling us food from around the globe. So we're getting all sorts of specialist shops selling us from different parts of the Far East, from the Middle East, um, yeah, all over, and catering for um, a very mixed clientele now that we have so many overseas students, overseas visitors, um, to a town that used to be very, very parochial, really, um, didn't have people from very far away at all. And vegetarianism and veganism being recognised as well. Arjuna, a well-established and favourite Cambridge shop. But still, the delivery problem. Uh, this monster in Market Hill, um, how does it get round there, well, ask oneself. Um, and Marks and Spencer, of course, not the biggest of the food stores. So we found that, that partly our food stores have moved out of the centre because they are so huge. Tesco's, which started off in St Andrew's Street, uh, now moved outside the centre of town. Um, bigger Sainsbury's outside the centre of town, Waitrose outside the centre of town and so on. Um, so that for many of us, we don't buy our food in the, the center anymore. We go to the big supermarkets outside. Um, how m as I say, get this lorry around? I don't know. I like this particular vegetable stall, fruit and vegetable stall, which is up in Fitzroy Street, where Grahams have acknowledged that they have visitors from all over and have very kindly put up welcome in different languages. Isn't that splendid? And again, no plastic. And to finish, we've just recently had this wonderful display of cows to remind us of the beginnings almost of Cambridge food supplies and the fact that our commons were providing the meat that Cambridge people ate um, for centuries before it started coming from further afield.